do good things with this money, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, how many of you have been enjoying Jonathan Destalo? It's been good, hasn't it? Well, he's back tonight and better than ever. Jonathan, would you come? Give him a hand if you would. Thank you, sir. And tonight we, uh, we want to do a couple of things, but the main thing, of course, is to talk about uh, conflict resolution. And uh, in addition to that, we've got a bunch of good questions. And by the way, uh, guys, put that number up on the board if you would. Uh, you, can, you can send us questions tonight, and we would, we would love to get to those tonight, if, and we think we will. Uh, that's the plan anyway. So as we talk through this tonight, if you have a question come to mind, please uh, send it to us uh, with that number that's up there, and we'll have it right here, and uh, we'll do our best to uh, take advantage of the time tonight and share with you along those lines. So Jonathan, take it away, brother. Well, good evening. Thanks for having me back. Pastor Gary, you make this opportunity easy because I can just hear in your heart a desire to um, get down into the roots of some of these things. So yeah. I appreciate that. Last week, I brought my bears. I forgot, I forgot them this evening. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit about how to talk. And it's a little bit like discussing on how to discuss before you have a discussion, talking about how you're going to talk about something. Do you follow? Is that clear or is that kind of muddy? But part of the problem is we run through some conversations so quickly, there is some benefit in slowing this down. Slowing it down, getting an idea of where we are at. As I said last week, it's hard to go somewhere new if you don't have a good understanding of where you are right now. So in relationships, there are, well, there's research out there that states couples, friends, family members even, are able to go back and forth between two types of conversation. We could put that slide up there. Conflict resolution, tools for communication. And the two kinds of conversation are work talk and heart talk. If you remember the principles I shared last week, there were three principles. One is, I am responsible for my own thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs. Principle number two, I am not responsible for your thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs. Principle number three, because we're in a relationship with each other, and that could be me and you, because we're in a community called Hope Church. could be me and Dusty, because we're in a covenant called marriage. But principle number three is, since we're responsible for, one another, for our own thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs, we do impact or we do influence each other's thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs. Are you tracking? Is that okay? So let's go to the slide that just kind of lays out work talk and heart talk. It should be the next one. Work talk is pretty straightforward. I'm glad you're laughing. I totally intended you guys to pick up on the comedy. It's, but it's not scary. Some of you out there may be going, oh, I'm staying away from heart talk. That just sounds complicated, and it looks ridiculous. Work talk is pretty straightforward, and we do this all the time. Um, who takes the kids to school? We have a quick discussion about that. Who's good, when the, our kids were younger, who's going to give the kids the medicine? We can't both do it. They'll be double dosing, and that's not good. So I'll do it. Who's going to do bath time? Who's going to do bedtime? And on and on through life. Um, are we going to have a joint account? Are we going to have a separate account? Um, uh, do we want to go to Price Cutter for grocery shopping? Do we want to go to a Walmart neighborhood market? You know, it's kind of simple. Starts with one point, ends at another point. The whole purpose is to move through this decision, this this discussion process using some information, using some data, who's cutting the grass, those kinds of things. You get it done, 
you arrived here tonight because in essence, you're able to have a work talk conversation with your spouse, with your parents, with your friend. I'll meet you at church at 6.30. Got it. Work talk conversation. Heart talk conversation is completely different, as you can see. Heart talk conversation has absolutely nothing to do with data, with facts. Nobody's making a decision. Nobody's fixing anything. Have you ever been on the receiving end of a conversation and you were told, well, you shouldn't feel that? Like all of a sudden, oh, you're going to tell me how I should feel. How pleasant is that conversation? <laughs> it's really colorful in a marriage. Super colorful. So, if work talk is A to B, because we're going somewhere, we're making a decision, heart talk is about, I can use a few words here, but heart talk is about the journey. Heart talk is about building a relationship. Heart talk is about connecting one with another. I can't really connect with you if I don't know how you feel about something. We don't really go below the surface if we don't get to the below the surface stuff. The below the surface stuff lies in the heart. So, for you to have a high degree of satisfaction in your relationships, if you're married or not, but if you're married in your friendships, um, you're going to have to navigate between the two kinds of conversations and know when it is you're talking work and when it is you're talking heart. So, before we go any further, there's just a little test. It's very impromptu. How many would say, I like heart talk more than work talk? Heart talk, people. How many would say, I'm all over work talk? Work talk, I've got it. Okay, keep your hands up if you're work talk. Work talk, people. Do you guys ever get angry? Do you get angry? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got feelings, right? You can be moved towards hard talk. Here's the thing that's interesting about identifying with work talk, and I didn't mean to put Pastor Gary on the spot or set him up. But we think it's easy because it's just straight. But what we really want is hard talk. That's what we really want. We want to be known Right? And we want to know people. I think we refer to this all the time in common cultural references. We say superficial relationships. Why do we even have to bother with super... Why even make the distinction? Uh, he's a friend, but it's just kind of superficial. It's because it's not what we yeah. really want. Yeah. So what we really want is hard talk. That's where it's at. Now, can we do that with everybody in our life? No because it's a little reckless. We can't just open up our heart to every, what's the expression, Tom, Dick, and Harry. I mean, we can't just do that. It's kind of reckless. And the scripture's pretty clear. Week one, Proverbs 4.23. Pretty sure about that. Guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of life. So, if we're busy guarding our heart, there's life there, and I want to share that but I don't just share it with everybody. There's some specific people I share that with. Okay, so if work talk is about making decisions, who's doing what, chores, etc., gathers information, hard talk is more of a meandering through this complicated, sometimes scary thing called feelings. But we're going to use feelings like information. We're not going to make judgment calls on feelings, but we're going to say, huh, you feel unloved. Oh, you feel unheard. It kind of helps fill in the gaps as you're trying to learn about somebody, get to know somebody. The feelings give you information that's valuable, super valuable. Okay, next slide. There's some keys for having a great heart talk. 
If the scripture admonishes us to guard our heart, that means if we're going to have a heart talk conversation, it's going to be by invitation only. That means it's going to be a moment where if I say to Dusty or if I say to Pastor Gary, I've got some feelings around a topic. Uh, I'm just going to make up a topic here. I've got some feelings around, I'll pick a silly one, uh, landscaping at church. I really, I've got some feelings about that. (laughs) I can understand your your pain. Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Which is beautiful, by the way. Yes, of course. Okay. I, yeah. I'm a but hard I, guy, you know. <laughs> but um, I've got some feelings around landscaping, or I've got some feelings around the coffee bar. I've got some feelings around some issues here. Would you be open to, now don't answer this, but would you be, would you be available to have a kind of hard talk conversation? Now, if I was Pastor Gary, <laughs> and I was honest with myself, <laughs> if I was honest with myself, and it's, uh, I don't know, 5.15 on a Wednesday night. I'm just putting my pastoral hat on, trying to think like Pastor Gary here. I don't know if I'd be up for a conversation about landscaping or the coffee bar on a Wednesday at 5.15. So, here's the thing that's key. And I'm, I'm talking slow because I really want the whole thing to be slowed down on purpose. I can talk faster, but I tend not to with topics related to the heart, okay? So if I want my yes to mean something to somebody, I have to feel free to say no if I'm Pastor Gary. If I'm Jonathan and I really want to build a connection with Pastor Gary, I have to be ready for a no. I really want to yes but I don't want a fake, I don't want a superficial yes. I don't want a fake yes. I don't want, I'm just going to, you know, shut him up. He would never say that. But I just don't, I don't want that. Because that's really, that would tap another button. You remember us talking about tapping buttons? So that, so, yes only means yes if I'm free to say no. So think of the person in your life that you would desire to have a connection with and think right now, if I'm not ready to say, ready to hear the words no, I'm probably not ready for a hard talk conversation. Hmm. And since I'm not ready for a hard talk conversation, I'm just going to open the floor up for a few seconds. Who can I talk to? And I don't mean this in a Sunday school kind of superficial way. You may be thinking it. No one said it yet. But I can talk to God. I can journal it out. I can write it out. Last week we talked about the five A's for the care cycle. That's exactly where you would use the care cycle. If I come to somebody I'm in relationship with and I just want to share with them something that's really stirring me. You know, if I get a little juicier here with the topic, I could say politics. I got some really strong feelings about Brent Kavanaugh. I got some really strong feelings about Trump. Whatever. It doesn't really matter, right? Because the issue is not the issue. The feeling is the issue. So I've got some feelings about it. If he's not ready, I'm not going to open my heart up for that. Vice versa, if he wants to come at me and I'm not ready, it's safer for me and, and our friendship for me to say no than for me to just say yes. Mm-hmm. Because it's what I think he wants to hear. It's what I think is the right thing to do in this moment, this kind of social, conventional pressure. Does the kingdom of God advance when we abide by social norms? Not really. It's my opinion that right. it doesn't. We advance with truth. We advance with uh, honesty. We advance with uh, care and love. But these kinds of maneuverings in relationships that don't want to 
I don't know if we get to the depth and core of the family of God experience when we do it that way. So that was just my opinion. So um, anyway, where are we at? So avoid the worst, the use of the word you as much as possible. Think of this, for example, when you buy a TV, flat screen TVs are almost passe now. It's like, here's the TV. But just think back a few years ago when bigger was better, right? Would you pick the TV with the thickest frame possible? Or would you pick the TV with the thinnest frame possible? And you would pick it with the thinnest frame possible. Why? Because you want to see the image as much as possible. When I make my conversation about Pastor Gary or when I make my, my feelings about Dusty, I thicken the frame of the TV. I thicken the frame of that picture. And what I end up doing in my attempt to explain all the details on how you do this, how you do that, how you missed, how it affected me because you did that, oof, I, my details start to crowd and crowd the real image, which is my heart. So now the channel or the picture is so much harder for Gary to see, so much harder for Dusty to see. Because they got to they gotta look through and look past all the framing of this mm -hmm. thing before they can actually see what's going on. So that's why I'm saying avoid the word you as much as possible. Now, does a TV work without a frame? I, I, we're not there yet. Eventually, I think we'll get there. Maybe projection. But there's at least some kind of border. So this is a tricky balance, and I hope you're hearing my heart in this thing. It does help to provide some context. But I'm telling you to gently walk down that road with context. Here's what you should do. If you catch yourself making a lot of time on context, here's what you did last week. You did the same thing two weeks ago. You did the same. It's been this way ever. Oh, my body alarm is going off. Now you're starting to work the care cycle, or you should go back and work and say to yourself, ah, maybe I'm not ready to have this conflict resolved with you because I'm still trying to resolve it myself. I'm responsible for my thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs. So, spend some time on the frame, but very little time on the frame. Second, uh, conversation is by invitation. I kind of covered that. Um, so number three is, is kind of, sometimes it's helpful to think of it like a traffic cop. Um, if we're going to have one speaker and one listener, that's the best way. It's not one speaker and then a speaker in waiting. Have you ever been in that kind of conversation? <laughs> where you're talking, but you know that person is already formulating their rebuttal. They're really not listening. So if you're going to take the time to invite, you kind of already establish some of that rhythm and just say, I'm the traffic cop here. Are you, in, are you available for a conversation that's about something going on inside me? Yes, I am. Great. So the other day, I just kind of felt unloved when this thing happened, and, and off you go. One speaker, one listener. The job of the speaker is to talk about the speaker's heart. The job of the listener is to talk about the speaker's heart. It's not, so again, we're not using information as a weapon back against the speaker. Mm. Right, so if I'm going to be vulnerable, it's not a moment for me as a listener or for Pastor Gary as a listener to take that vulnerability and whack it over my head. So one speaker, one listener, not a listener, not a speaker in waiting, okay? And avoid use of the word you. Um, summarize and validate. That is a listener's skill. And you know what? Uh, these are skills. And sometimes, uh, you know, I'm sharing this information, and you may be feeling like, I've never even heard of this stuff. And maybe you walk out thinking, uh, or push to the side. 
I don't know why I'm whistling. <clears throat> but anyway, um, it's a skill. How many came out of the womb knowing how to walk or throw a baseball? <laughs> it, they're just things that grow over time, the more you use them. And here's what we consider a win. If you have this kind of hard talk conversation and it spins out of control, in the past, that spinning out of control may have taken two hours long. Maybe it lasted two weeks long. Maybe you're here tonight and it's been years. What I'm saying is that tonight, if you can recover that by one day, by one hour, by one minute, that's a victory. So you have this conversation with somebody, it spins out of control. Normally it would have taken two hours for things to settle back down. Now it takes an hour and a half. Fantastic. You've just saved yourself a half an hour of pain. So it'll just take time. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that it's not easy, but it's worth it. It'll just take time. So... Um, Summarize and validate. What does summary look like? So if I were to hear the words from my wife, you know, I just feel unloved when and uncared for when on Saturdays, you remember this from last Wednesday if you were here, on Saturdays you don't really enjoy going to the grocery store with me. I really would like for you to love it, but but I get that that's your feeling to own. But gosh, if you were to come with me and walk with me, I would feel so cared for. Now, I'm the listener, and I can say what I hear you say is that you would love for me to love going grocery shopping. <laughs> but more than that, you really just want to spend time with me. Is that right? And she would say, yes. Okay, now here's another key. Is there anything else? Is there anything else? So you saw that last slide, it was like a squiggly line. I could have also just drawn like an onion cut in half. You ever see an onion cut in half? It's got all those rings. You may start at the center, or you may start at the outside, really doesn't matter. But you know the experience. It's just layer after layer after layer till you get to the core, or till you get to the outside however you want to look at it. So a good listener, if the heart is being opened up, understands there's gold there. I think we use that word a lot. I love it. There's gold there. You want to make sure you are going after the gold as much as possible. So here's my summary. Is there anything else? Yes, there is. And no, I don't know, so I'm making this up. But she may have more to say. The speaker, you've got some options now. If the listener captured it, you can say yes. You could say no and try again. You could say kind of. You kind of got it. I, I, it's not that I really love grocery shopping. I love spending time with you. Uh, okay, so it's not that you love grocery shopping. It's that you love spending time with me. Groceries is just a vehicle to get to spend time with me. And she could say, yes, fantastic. So if you put yourself in my shoes, change the details of this conversation, can you see how that would create a tighter connection to the person in your life? Because you've created understanding. You've not worked to change their feelings. You just kind of summarize what they've said. You can also now give them another gift. They've given you gold. Here's your gold back to them you can say, that makes sense to me. Uh, listen, you're not crazy. I get it. There are some things I wish you could spend time with me, but, and you know when I think about it, you sit and watch the Red Sox beat the Yankees last night. I know you didn't like it, but I felt like you loved it. We're, we're Red Sox fans. I hope you invite me back. I just I shouldn't have never said that. No problem. Okay. So yeah, that's the gold I can give back. 
to my friend, to my wife, to my colleague and my friend. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and that, that makes sense to me. It's called empathy. You need to use a lot more of that in the church, empathy. It's not agreeing with. It's not um, step aside, so let me feel it for you. It's like, wow, you really feel something strong about this topic. That makes sense. I get it. Yeah. And you know, when I stop and think about it, you came here, you spent some time even talking to me. Wow. So even to carve time out of your day to talk, wow, yeah, this means a lot to you. I appreciate that. So that's the gold you can give back to them, okay? You form a tight bond. Now, the top key, you can forget all these steps as long as you remember these two things. Both hearts matter, and both hearts should be treated safely. Both hearts matter, both hearts should be treated. What does that mean? Again, if I'm saying yes when I truly feel no, that's not safe, that's, that's not going to be fruitful or productive. But if I've arrived at that place where I can hear it, I can listen to it, I'm being safe, she's being safe with her heart, she's not just going, Woof, here I am. She's going to try it out, open, try it out again, open, feels like it's safe, I can keep going, open again, and now we have this understanding, so as long as both hearts matter and both hearts are treated safely, you can change this, you can take it in a direction that's unique or customizable for you guys, okay? That's just kind of the backdrop to how to resolve conflict. We haven't actually got there yet, but how many can recognize that if I really understand where my spouse is coming from or where my pastor is coming from, how big is that conflict now? It may have started off like this, but gosh, spending some time feeling, understanding the feeling, appreciating that, takes the conflict, brings it down like this. And all the strong feelings I may have had about coffee or about landscaping <laughs> kind of look silly because I've spent some time getting to know the heart behind it, okay? So just keep that in mind. You, you may not want to do this heart talk, but I'm telling you, it'll save you. There's seven steps in this conflict resolution. And I'm telling you, many couples, many people never make it through the seven steps because by step two, could you go to the second, the next slide? By step two, they're good. Have you ever been in a conflict with your spouse over the paint color in your dining room? <laughs> or what furniture to buy, what movie to watch? Silly, silly things. In a hundred years, not worth a dime. Doesn't really matter. But in the moment, it's like all you can see. If you spend time getting to know each other's heart, the paint color, I can give up paint color. Psh. I think we fought about paint color. I don't even remember, but I don't think so. Um, but, you know, there are silly things that we fight. I remember when we were dating. We were in Bible school. We were dating. We had this massive, it's so stupid. I hope you laugh right there with me. But we had a massive argument about our future life and our future kids and what we would give them for breakfast. That's how ridiculous. <laughs> That's how ridiculous. So I grew up in an Italian home. I never tasted Chef Boyardee in my whole life, still to this day. I, I don't even know what it tastes like. Don't want to. I've never known a Pop-Tart in my life up until that point. But we had this discussion like, well, yeah, Dusty says, well, sometimes we're just giving them Pop-Tarts. And I, for some reason, I zeroed in on Pop-Tarts. I, <laughs> I would not let it go. And we wasted a few hours, maybe even the weekend, talking about Pop-Tarts for the kids that hadn't even been born yet. We weren't even married. That's how ridiculous. So, yeah. <clears throat> Step number one, agree to a no-losers policy. What does that mean? Um, so I mentioned baseball. It's kind of... Baseball, October baseball is the best baseball, but 
man, the Chiefs are doing really well. There are a bunch of team sports. I can grab some analogies from that. So I'll do that. If Patrick Mahomes was to have a fantastic game, throw five touchdowns, but the other team scored six touchdowns, does Patrick still lose? He's lost. Tyreek Hill, he can have rushed for 100-plus yards. If the score is still Chiefs on the losing end, the Chiefs have lost. Mm -hmm. So I want to throw a big... I want to pop this balloon called compromise. And I recognize that a lot of people feel differently about compromise, but I'm just going to offer this to you guys as another option. I actually think compromise does more damage than good. Here's why. Especially in marriage. So if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to step into the marriage uh, fast and furious here for a moment. So you may not be married, but stick with me because it applies. If we compromise, then it becomes this understanding of win-loss, win-loss. And who's keeping track? Do you remember last week we talked about four useless questions? One of them was who's right, who's wrong? That's a result of compromise. Whose fault was this? Have you ever made a purchase and looked to your spouse and said, well, it was your idea? Those purchases go from stocks to houses to vacations, not just what kind of apple juice to buy. But if you start keeping score, like, well, you had your turn at the red box last time. I'm going to do it this time. Hey, if it works for you, fantastic. But I just want you to think. But Jonathan said compromise kind of is a breeding ground for conflict. Why? Because I'm not really being true to my feelings. Again, they don't, make to, they don't get to make all the decisions, but you know what? If you, if you come to the decision to like about buying a house and you're not really honest with your spouse about it, man, that's a 200, 300, 400, depending how deep your pockets are, half a million dollar investment that you will have to live with and somehow try to get over because, well, okay, you chose the last house. I'm going to choose this one. But if you use the hard talk principle and get to an understanding of why you want this particular neighborhood, what that school means to you, just kind of take some time to look at this onion, peel the layer, peel the layer, Mind the gold, peel the layer, mind the gold. Man, now you've got a connection. The, my colleagues that I work with feel so strongly about step number one. I won't tell you their names, not that I'm ashamed to, not that they would be embarrassed to, but I just think it's going to be a distraction. You'd be like, who's that, who's that? But they feel so strongly about this, they consider this an ethic second to serving Christ. Second, only to serving Christ. So serving Christ first in my marriage, step number one is the next most important thing. It's powerful. It's huge. Because if I win, Dusty loses, I lose. If she wins and I lose, she loses. We're in a team. We do this together. Or not at all. We move together or not at all. In fact, I think I could extrapolate that. Pastor Gary, you, you tell me if you're comfortable with this. And The church moves together or not at all. As much as possible. Sure. Yeah. We make voting decisions. We move together or we hear from the floor or we don't move forward. Sometimes, actually, we just say, you know what? There's not enough clarity. We need to pray. Then we'll come back and meet, get some feelings on the floor, move together. Okay, but back to marriage. If I win, she loses, I lost. So agree to a no-losers policy. We wear the same jersey. We're on the same team. There's no such thing as me wearing the uh, 
Chiefs jersey or the Red Sox jersey, and she wears the Red Sox jersey, and I come away with the win, and she comes away with the loss. That doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. You're on the same team, no loser's policy. That means I will speak up if I feel like there's a hint of a loss for me. She will speak up if she feels like there's a little hint of a loss for her. Mm-hmm. You have to be committed to that. For the body of Christ, the same thing. We don't war against each other. We war against principalities and powers of this world in the supernatural. So if I look at my brother and my sister and say, I'm going to win over them, it's a loss for the body of Christ. Hard talk, the issue, step number two. If I agree to no loser's policy, we're going to take some time, slow it down, talk about our heart and the issues of the heart. And we're going to pray for unity. I'm not going to ask you to stand to single anybody out. But I just think we should stand. This is how important I feel it is. I'll stand right there with you. Would you stand with me? And we're just going to take a moment. Because if we're believers, then we recognize we're not in this alone that God's purposes really move forward in unity. Can we just take a moment and pray? Now, you may have your issues right now. It could be about a house purchase. It could be something more hurtful. It could be about an addiction. It could be about some words that were said. It could be about an expenditure that you're really wondering why your spouse did that. Can we just take a minute and pray for unity around that? connect with how it made us feel and ask God to step in, intervene, and bring unity where there's discord. Hmm. You're going to see some of this as we move through it. Some of this is actually steps four, five, six, and seven. You probably find out there in Google world. I don't think it's unique to focus on the family, but step three is unique to the body of Christ for sure. Let's just take a minute and pray. Lord, we just thank you that there may be some experiences um, that we've walked through that have been painful and have been hurtful. We experience them as truth in our life, but we know that truth with a capital T is that you don't waste pain. Mm -hmm. You know how to take that broken vessel You know how to take that broken heart. You know how to take those strained relationships and redeem what was once thought to be lost and revive what was once thought to be dead and restore what was once thought to be broken. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord. We are leaning into your wisdom tonight that that truth would set us free to think beyond perhaps our experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. I'm just kind of in real time working through these seven steps just as though I was working through them one-on-one with you or maybe you envision yourself working them one-on-one with your friend, your spouse, your parent. Okay? So we prayed. We actually pray because we actually believe it makes a difference. Step number four, we're going to brainstorm. That means we're going to green light every issue. So depending on the issue, and I can't, I can fill the rest of the time just thinking about issues. I don't want to do that because we want to spend some time on the questions that were sent in. But whatever the issue is, excuse me, think like if money was no object. Think like that. Think like, okay, if I had every resource available to me, what would I do about this problem that we have? Just go. Go. In fact, take a pen to paper, depending on the issue, depending on the context, like where you may be at the time. Maybe it's convenient to write. Maybe not. You can just kind of bounce ideas back off one another. So I get how you feel. Do you understand how I feel? We've prayed. 
What about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about that? Okay. What about this? What about that? Nobody is evaluating anything. The easiest way to squash brainstorm is to say what? That'll never work. What are you thinking? That's, That's crazy. Now we're back to fear. Now we're talking like fear. So brainstorm the issue. Then step five, you may have a list of 10, 5, 15, 20 things. However many things you have, start, step back and go, wow, okay, we really got creative with that one. I, I don't see us ever moving to Hawaii. Um, winning the lottery would be nice, but that's likely not going to happen. Okay. Just start evaluating your options and whittle it down. You don't have to go from 20 to, let's say, 1. But you go from 20 to like 7, 20 to 5, 20 to 10. So let, let's say you're left with like 5. Pick one. Step number six, select one option and test it out. What's the worst that can happen? I'm going to refer you to step number one. If the thing fails, you both have done it and agreed on it together. Yeah. So there is no pointing a finger, Right? If you're both going to own the decision, then now there's no hard feelings when the thing falls apart. Because, oh, gosh, it fell apart because we forgot to think about X, Y, Z. Man, I totally forgot our taxes are due on that, and we can't make that purchase on that day. Whatever it is. But you're not looking at your teammate. You're not looking at your brother or sister in Christ going, it's your problem. It's your fault. You see, I compromised the last this time, and look at where we are. Last step, check back in, tweak as necessary. So we're going to go with this one option, whatever it is. We're going to just let it go for like a week. We're going to agree on a time frame and just go back and say, all right, is it working for you still? Kind of think of yourself like, again, like a teammate. How many times do we use, do we see timeouts on the field? What happens at a timeout? Everybody regroups. The weather conditions have changed. They made a play that we weren't expecting. Let's regroup. Coach is going to give a new plan, or he's going to tweak the plan that was already in place. Everybody got it? Okay, let's go back out there. That's essentially what step number seven is. All right. That's, That's all I've got for tonight. That's good. That's good <laughs> I hope stuff. that that helps you guys. And I think... Yeah. Oh. Uh. That's so good. I mean, that, that kind of, we need to role play that for about three weeks and get that down in our heads. Uh, one, one question I want to ask you is I, I run into this all the time with couples that are really what I would consider in a, in a crisis, in a, in a counseling scenario. And one of the things that I always see come up is when they were saying, well, I just want it to be honest. And they unload this horrific thing that becomes the boulder between them from there on out, and yeah. communication becomes almost right. impossible. Right. What, what, how honest do people need to be when they're in conflict? Well, it starts with the principles. So it starts with honesty with self. Mm -hmm. if, if it's this big issue, and I'm, we're talking in generalities, so, mm -hmm. um, but if, if it's a big issue, if it's infidelity, right? Or if it's uh, pornography or something really hurtful, painful. The tendency is to want to make it about what they did. And to some degree, right. that is the frame. Yeah, sure. That's the context. But it's not all the frame. So those are painful conversations. But what helps people get unstuck in those very stuck moments is for each spouse to recognize that they both are hurting. If we're going to make it a competition, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. I hurt worse than you. Really? Well, I hurt worse than you. Right. So now we're, we're back to competition, win-loss, and that. Yeah, you're not meeting my needs. or You're not whatever. meeting my needs. Right. In fact, you went outside to meet a need. Right. So 
There is a little bit of context that is required, and there's a, a repair for integrity that needs to happen, obviously. Yeah. But the more time we spend connecting with one another in terms of how this... The reality is, if I go down this road of infidelity a little bit more, um, the person who was unfaithful, in some ways, it's not competition, but in some ways is just as hurt, if not more hurt. Because they've shown up in a way that is not true to who God made them to be. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sure. Yeah. So it's not a comp. Yeah. It's not a pain competition, but we get stuck when we make it about a pain competition. Wh whatever it happens to be. So, Pastor, we're having a problem. Blah, 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 blah. Right. And uh, my suggestion would be to say, okay, I get all the details. If all that was to go away, how would you feel? Mm -hmm. and start looking for mining for the gold, mining for the heart, mm -hmm. get to the heart. Because the truth is we're not powerful enough, right? If an affair has happened, it's happened. I can't go back and change anything. Right. Well, whatever happens to be. So, man, it's, it's painful. I just lost my train of thought. But it, it's painful, and I can't do anything about it. The reality is, if God isn't enough, my spouse will never be good enough. Until God's enough, she will never be good enough, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Uh, somebody else asked this one. I think it's relevant here, and when we're being honest and trying to open up and have a heart talk, uh, they asked, how can we learn to trust again once trust has been broken? I would say, are you trustworthy? Let's move away from trust. It's almost not a fair question. Mm -hmm. It's almost not a fair request to make. Right. Because if I own my thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and beliefs, you own yours, I just, I have to be responsible for me. So if I can show up as a trustworthy person, trust flows naturally. That's good. I usually will say, I trust that guy because some, or that lady because that's, to some degree, they've presented themselves as trustworthy people. So we've already made that connection. Our heart is already connected with them in that way. And our mind says, yep, I agree. So the question is, how do you know when to trust again? Start with focusing on being a trustworthy person. Okay, that's good. One final one that just came in tonight is, how do you know when to be patient and kind and endure and endure all things and when to confront? Uh, why? <laughs> <clears throat> or you can answer, what's the date of the second coming of Jesus? Either yes. one you want to answer. Uh, I'll go with the second one. Yeah, let's go with that one. <laughs> um, let me hear that one more time. Okay. How do you know when to be patient, kind, and endure all things, and when to confront? Okay. If you confront, will you continue to be patient and kind and enduring? Good question. Or when you confront, it will, will you cease to be patient, kind, and enduring? If you can continue being patient, kind, enduring... By all means, go confront. Really good answer. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, that shows self-care. Yeah. Not someone's yeah. hurt me. Until I get to the place where God is enough, I'm not ready to confront. Because then I'll make it about them and their yard, not what's happening in my yard. Exactly. Yeah. That's really, really good. Um, those ladies down in the nursery are not going to be patient, kind, and enduring with me if I don't wrap this up. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you all stand? <clears throat>